Do you remember the first time that you performed real mathematics? I'm not talking about math in a classic high school setting where you were told to just plug things into a formula. Rather, I'm talking about the abstract world of proofs where there isn't really a clear way to get to the answer. For example, one of the first things I was asked to prove in my discrete math course was that the sum of the first n odd numbers was n squared. You can look at this formula for various values of n and see that it works. The first one odd number is, well, one, which is equal to one squared. The first two odd numbers are one and three, which sum to four, which is two squared. The first three odd numbers are one, three, and five, which sum to nine, which is three squared, and so on. But to prove this for any general n is a bit of an interesting task if you come from a computational background. Here there isn't any formula to plug numbers into. Instead, you're left with a wide open problem for homework. That isn't to say that there aren't guidelines in place. Often you'll learn a few proof techniques such as induction or proof by contrapositive, but at first, it can still be a shot in the dark to see which method to use. For example, proof by induction was one of the first methods I learned. You start with a base case where you know what you are trying to prove is true. Then we say that if some generic k works, we try to prove that the k plus 1 term also has to work, which is our inductive step. Combining these gives a nice staircase-like proof technique. We know that the first step is true, and since k works, k plus 1 works, i.e. 2 works. Then since 2 works, 3 has to work. Then since 3 works, 4 has to work, and so on. Using induction on our n-squared problem is the way to prove this. We know that our base case works, since the sum of the first 1 odd numbers, 1, is 1 squared. Then we assume that a generic k works, and try to prove it for k plus 1. To come up with a general formula for generic k, we can note that even numbers can be represented by 2k. The first even number is 2, which if you plug in 1 for k, you get. The second even number is 4, which if you plug in 2 for k, you get. And so on. We can then apply the same process for odd numbers. 2k minus 1 gives the kth odd number. 1 is the first odd number, which if we plug in 1 for k, we get 2 minus 1, which is 1. 3 is the second odd number, which if we plug in 2 for k, we get 4 minus 1, which is 3, and so on. Our inductive step is to assume that this holds for a generic k, which we can represent with 1 plus 3 plus something plus 2k minus 1 equals k squared. We then try to prove that if a generic k works, then the next term has to be true as well. To start, add 2k plus 1 to both sides, since that's the k plus 1 term. 1 plus 3 plus on and on and on plus 2k minus 1 plus 2k plus 1 equals k squared plus 2k plus 1. You can factor that right side as k plus 1 squared, which is exactly what we expect and want. So we've shown that if k is true, then k plus 1 has to be true, and you can then use your base case to build your proof inductively. Now I know that was a lot, but I hope that it serves as a showcase of what higher level mathematics entails. Induction, like all proof techniques, isn't concerned about particular mathematical ideas, since proofs by induction are seen in many different fields from number theory to graph theory. Rather, I've always seen it as an exercise in logic. You see these individual steps that you can say, yes, that makes sense, and a proof technique emerges by combining them together into something workable. Overall, in pure mathematics, you start out with a problem to solve and only a couple guardrails to keep you in place. It's the freedom of trying different solutions until you find one that works, and the thrill when you finally get to a proof you're proud of that has kept me continuing to study mathematics all of these years. But there's another question that I think needs to be answered, which is the stereotypical question asked in a high school math class. When will I ever need to know this? Sure, the sum of the first n odd numbers equaling n squared is cool and all, but is there an application? I think that this is a good question, but it is a bit misguided. Rather than taking something away from the problems themselves, I think what students should take from mathematics most is the way to solve problems. I don't think it is as important to remember the n squared fact as it is to consider the method of considering a few base cases, then extending it for future cases. To end this video, I'll close with what I consider one of my first proofs. Because while it doesn't have the formalism of modern mathematics, it solves a problem in an elegant way and was my first deviation from math that focused only on plugging numbers into a formula. In high school, I was really into paper crafts. Basically, this is making 3D objects and mechanical parts out of paper. 
It was fun to cut graph paper into the nets of different 3D shapes and fold them. But during some project I was working on, I remembered I needed to make paper cones that had a certain steepness. The way that I generally made cones was that I took a sector of a circle and connected the two edges that formed. It should be intuitive that if the sector is large, then the cone isn't very steep, and if the sector is small, then the cone should be very steep. But trying to find an exact formula that matched the angle of a given sector with the angle of elevation for the cone that is formed wasn't something that I initially knew. What I did was look at a generic sector of a circle and a generic cone and saw that there was a few variables that overlapped. For example, the radius of the circle sector is equal to the slant height of the cone. Then I noticed that the circumference of the circle sector should be equal to the circumference of the cone. The circumference of a circle is pi times diameter, or 2r. Since we're considering a circle sector, that should be some fractional part of that, which turns out to be theta over 2 pi. The 2 pi's cancel out, leaving theta times r as the circumference of the circle sector. On the other side, when we're dealing with the cone, we have 2 times pi times the radius, except here the radius isn't known. But a quick calculation with the slant height leaves the radius as r cosine of phi and thus the circumference as 2 pi times r cosine of phi. Setting these two circumferences equal to each other, we can cancel the r's, leaving our final formula of theta equals 2 pi times the cosine of phi. The formula should be intuitive. If your angle of elevation is really low, then cosine of phi is closer to 1, and 2 pi isn't diminished by that much, meaning that the angle of the circle sector is closer to 2 pi. If, on the other hand, you have a really steep angle, then cosine of phi is closer to zero, and thus 2 pi is diminished a lot more, and you have a smaller angle of the circle sector. This small proof that I did towards the end of high school was the first quasi-break I had from computational mathematics. I wasn't given a formula to plug things into. Instead, I derived the formula that I needed, and I was picking up on key observations about the radius and the circumference being the same, and following a logical set of steps from there that led me to the proof. In hindsight, it was a small victory, because really, who is going to need to know how the angle of a sector of a circle relates to the angle of elevation of a paper cone? Honestly, probably just me. But the true takeaway I got from the experience was how I problem solved. Pure mathematics, to me, is the art of problem solving. If you are given a problem like proving the n-squared fact, or finding a formula for making paper cones, you should get out a solid proof for a formula that works, but more importantly, you should get out a new way to think.